you're in the subpage that says Jefferson, okay? Under 3A. Well, good. Everybody's set? Almost. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Thomas Jefferson's presidency and how it changed the United States. Yesterday we talked about John Adams and how he attempted to change the United States. Now we're going to carry over into Thomas Jefferson. So if there was a student body president here at Seaford and you guys had to nominate someone or pick someone to be president of the high school, who would you pick? It could be anybody in this class, could be your friend. You pick yourself? No. No? Luke Bloom? Luke Bloom? Matt Cruz. Matt Cruz, why? He's a good leader. He's a good leader? Oh, very. Nobody in this class? I pick Joey. You pick Joey? Yeah. What? Joey's got good presidential qualities? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Well, yeah? Everything about him. Nice face. Everything about him? He's all around guy. He's a good kid, right? Sex yeah. What about Peter? Who would you pick? Student body president. Secret. You can pick yourself if you want. You can pick yourself. Nobody in this. Nobody would pick anybody in this class. I mean, Luch would be a good leader, but no. I mean, Kelsey's picking herself. You guys, you guys, cool, Kelsey. I mean, Kelsey's still turning. No. Oh. All right. So we got a bunch of options. So talking about Thomas Jefferson. What do we know about Jefferson so far? Like, what are his? What are one of his, his biggest achievements? Remember the, remember the argument between the Federalists, the Jeffersonian Republicans? What else is what else has uh, Jefferson done? He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Wrote the Declaration, very good. So today we're gonna get into his presidency and we are going to start. Maybe where you going? Oh I feel eighteen eighteen hundred eighteen hundred and So you want to highlight the important part that it was transferring hand peacefully from one party to another. The reason it was called the Revolution of 1800 is because Adams and Jefferson had opposing viewpoints. So think back to the chart that we did on Monday about Jeffersonian Republicans and the Federalists. There were two different viewpoints in there, both battle battling for the presidency. So Adams was trying to dispute Jefferson's viewpoints and win the presidency. That didn't end up working. So here we have a picture of a letter that President Bush wrote to President Clinton. This shows that it is pretty much President Clinton uh, President Bush leaving Clinton with good wishes in his presidency, which is significant because it does, because in the election of 1800, Adams and Jefferson were fighting head to head, and there was no well wishes left. So it shows that we are out of that revolutionary stage, and here there are actually presidents nowadays leaving each other, wishing each other well. Influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment, believe in the central government of the pattern, the role of the government is to protect individual liberties, which government government is the type of government. So you want to highlight the, it, that it is influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment and that the role of the government is to protect individual liberties. Does anybody remember what those individual liberties are that are in the Bill of Rights? What are they called? Amen. Amen. It's very good. So these quotes were said by Jefferson. So when he says the government that governs best governs least, this mean this means that he is in favor of the people ruling. So also think back to that same chart on the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans. Shows that he does not want a uh, government that is ruled by like a king. And stay off the front long government means that he does not want the government to get involved in people's everyday lives and that the people should be the ones ruling. Domestic policy changes cut spending on the military and repealed the expansion of the Navy, repealed the tax on whiskey and all other excite taxes, kept Hamilton's financial program basically intact repealed the Alien and Sedation Acts and reinstated the five-year residency requirements for citizenship, pardoned the 
pardoned Republicans convicted under the Alien and Sedition Act. So all the stuff we've been talking about this week, the whiskey tax, the Alien and Sedition Act, which we talked about yesterday, those things under Jefferson are now gone. But Hamilton's financial plan was still kept intact. And under the citizenship residency, five was reduced back down to five years instead of 14 years. Jefferson's presidency, he did let the bank continue to function because its term would run out in 1811 after 20 years. Thomas Jefferson's greatest rivals were Vice President Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. In the summer of 1804, Burr killed Hamilton in a duel. So Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, they did not see eye to eye. Aaron Burr ran with Thomas Jefferson under the Jeffersonian Republican Party, which and then Alexander Hamilton released some documents on Aaron Burr that were talking down upon him and then when they ran during the presidency, the reason, one of the main reasons Adams lost the election is because Burr released a document that was Adams was talking about bad about Federalist President Adams, which Alexander Hamilton is a Federalist, so it makes Alexander Hamilton look bad, which is one of the main reasons Jefferson won the election. So I would highlight here that his greatest rival was Aaron Burr, and I would make note of the significance of Hamilton and Burr. So here is a picture of Alexander Burr killing Alexander Hamilton. So it just shows like the kind of duel, how, how it happened back then. Attacking the Judiciary, the Judiciary Act of 1801, passed by Federalist Congress and 16 judges to the federal courts. Midnight judges, Federalist President John Adams fills all the positions with Federalist judgments. judges. Republicans accused Federalists of attacking the courts with anti-Jefferson judges. So you want to highlight the Judiciary Act of 1801. So the Judiciary Act is where we get the idea of judicial review from. And the midnight judges refer to judges that are appointed by John Adams. So he tries to appoint these judges at the last second of his presidency, like the last few days of his presidency, which is where the term midnight comes from. He wants to pack the courts with a bunch of Federalists, which is the opposing viewpoint of Jefferson, so hopefully to make Jefferson's presidency not go well. Chief Justice, Justice John Marshall, 1801 to 1835, appointed by President John Adams in the last days to vote Federalist and believer in strong central government, led and dominated the Supreme Court for 34 years long after Federalist Party had disappeared. So you want to highlight that he, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, is the valid Federalist and the believer in strong central government. So he is appointed by Adams in his last days, and he goes against pretty much everything Jefferson believes in, which is one of the main reasons why Adams appointed him. And he rules there for a very long time, about 34 years. So here is a picture of Chief Justice John Marshall. Doesn't look like a nice guy in the world. So, no. Marbury v. Madison, in the case William Marbury, a Federalist, was appointed as a judge by Adams. Marbury's appointment was withheld by a section of the state. James Madison and Marbury received for his commission. Chief Justice John Marshall dismissed the case, claiming the Supreme Court did not act on it because the clause of the Judiciary, Judiciary Act of 1789 that he was asked to use was unconstitutional. So put a star next to this case, Marbury versus Madison, one of the most important cases in Jefferson's presidency. So the Judiciary Act of 1801, you have the Judiciary Act of 1789. Both of these acts are where the idea of a judicial review comes from. This case is the main idea that is why judicial review is incorporated today. Just put a star next to this case. Result judicial review. Marshall ruled against Mulberry, declaring that it was against the Constitution for the Supreme Court to give an order to the executive branch. Established power of judicial review for the Supreme Court 
enables it to review state laws and state uh, court decisions to determine if they are in line with the Constitution and to decide whether laws passed by Congress are constitutional. Also want to put a slide next to this slide. So here, here's your idea of a judicial review from the ruling in Marbury versus Madison. So Congress is allowed is now allowed to decide if laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. So here's a quote from Marbury versus Madison. It is empathically the throwing and the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. So this is just stressing the idea of judicial review. Now the judicial department of government says what the laws are. McCoolidge vs. Maryland. Congress had established a second national bank and soon had branches in other states. A private bank in Maryland did not like uh, competing with the federal, federal bank, so it decided to tax it. The national bank refused to pay, and the state sued bank. Supreme Court sides with the national bank, using the necessary and proper clause to back it up. So you guys want to highlight the necessary and proper clause. We've heard this term before, it's just used in a different way. Does anybody remember or have an idea 